Let me ask you a couple of quick questions. Can your prospects see your business? Do they even know you exist? If they have a problem, do they think of your business first? It's pretty easy to answer these questions. Here's a litmus test. If you're not already a millionaire, then you can be sure that not enough people know about your business yet. So consider this. How much more money would you start making today if your prospects thought of you and your products every time they had a related problem they needed to solve? How much would that kind of top of mind awareness be worth to you? $10,000? $100,000? A million? Maybe a few million. I mean, think about this for a second. Lots of people say, I'm going to Google that, when what they really mean is that they're going to search for something online. Yet Google has so thoroughly dominated the search engine market that the brand name itself is synonymous with searching online. And they're not the only company with a great branding strategy. Another example is Kleenex, which is synonymous with facial tissues in the U.S. Let me toss another one at you. People who need a bandage sometimes ask for a Band-Aid, which, again, is a brand name. And maybe you've even heard some inline skaters say they're going rollerblading. That's also a brand name. Now just stop and think about how powerful it is to dominate a market so thoroughly that your business's brand name becomes interchangeable with the product itself. Imagine if that happened to you. Imagine if your brand name was the first thing people thought of when they had a problem in your niche and they needed a solution. I'll tell you what would happen. You'd be rich with a capital R. There's no doubt about it. So I want you to pay attention to this next bit very carefully because when you truly understand it is when you can take your business to the next level and add a zero to your yearly revenue. Okay, here it is. The business that controls the most mind share in the market also controls the most wealth. They make the most sales, they have the most customers, and they make more money than everyone else. That's what I'd like to see you do in your niche, and the good news is that we can make it happen together starting today. Introducing Bulletproof Branding, which is a -a one-of-a-kind video training course that shows you how to use the exact same branding strategies the biggest companies in the world use to grow their businesses and secure their financial future. Now, just imagine what a strong brand can do for your business. Listen, a lot of business owners just skim over topics like branding because they think it's not important. But that's one myth that could cost you millions of dollars over the life of your business. It might even make you go bankrupt. Think about it this way. The direct response advertising you do puts money in your pocket today. But you'll need to start all over again tomorrow with advertising if you want to make more money. However, the branding you do today puts money in your pocket every day of the week for the long term. That's because it gets people thinking about your products even when they haven't seen your advertisements in a while. And that's why it's such an excellent investment of your time and resources. So listen, when you control your prospects' minds with branding, then you control their wallet. Simply put, there's no better way to get rich in business than to create an awesome branding strategy. And that's exactly what you'll discover how to do inside this video training course. Throughout this course, you'll learn the exact branding strategies the world's top marketers use every single day to build top-of-mind awareness and bank more revenue. And now you too can use these extremely profitable strategies to do three things to benefit your business. 1. Good branding gives your prospects a strong reason to buy products and service from you rather than your competitors. This is the best way to absolutely dominate your market. 2. Good branding cements customer loyalty to turn one-time customers into valuable lifetime customers who put thousands of dollars into your pocket for years to come. And 3. Good branding boosts sales and revenue over the long term to grow your business and take it to the next level. That's why this course shows you absolutely everything you need to know to develop a powerhouse branding strategy to boost sales, crush your competition, and dominate your market for years to come. If you've been looking for the missing link to business success... This is it. And let me tell you something. If you think branding is all about creating a logo and a slogan, then this eye-opening course is going to shock you and rock your world. You'll discover how some of the world's most successful businesses thrived and grew with the help of a strong branding strategy. And how your business can too. You'll find out the number one mistake uninformed business owners are making that's absolutely killing their long-term business growth and how you can avoid it with ease. 
You'll get the little known five P's of branding anatomy you must know in order to successfully compete in today's crowded marketplace. You'll learn the surprising mistakes many business owners make, which dilutes their brand and virtually erases their market share. But don't worry, you'll get a surefire plan for avoiding this deadly mistake. You'll discover absolutely everything you need to know to create a strong brand which makes a fantastic first impression and keeps your customers eagerly knocking down your virtual door. You'll get the complete strategy for creating what every business owner would kill for. That's top of mind awareness. This is what makes your prospects think of your business first when they have a problem on their mind and cash in their hand. This is a no-guesswork strategy, because you'll even find out how to quickly and easily test your branding concepts to make sure your audience loves them as much as you do. You'll also get 11 different ways to position your product as the absolute best choice in your market. If you want to dominate your market, you need to know these strategies. And let me tell you, they're going to blow you away. Bottom line is, this video training course gives you absolutely everything you need to build a brand from scratch, refine it, infuse it into absolutely everything you do, and use it to turn your average business into a wildly profitable, unbeatable behemoth in your market. You'll even get over two dozen real-life examples of how the world's most successful companies built brands which crushed their competitors, and how you can do the same thing no matter what you're selling. Plus, this video training course includes a manual with transcripts and planning sheets so you can take action on what you learn right away. This is going to take your business to the next level. Okay, if you're serious about your business and you don't want to dabble in the shallow end of the business pool anymore, then grab this course right now using the buy button below. Don't be the business owner who works on his business all day but has very little to show for it. Don't be the one who rolls over and lets his competition walk all over him and take food off his table. Don't be the one who has to work four times as hard as everyone else because he can't get his customers to stick around for the long term. Instead, be the savvy entrepreneur who understands that image and emotion are everything when it comes to branding, and when you build an unbeatable brand, you can virtually write your own ticket in life. It starts right here, right now, with you clicking the buy button. Do it now, and let's get started building your profitable brand together. Just think about the last time you went shopping. Let's suppose you needed to buy some coffee, okay? You walked into the coffee aisle, you scanned shelf after shelf of different types of coffee, you grabbed one, and you walked away. I'm going to guess there were at least a half a dozen different brands of coffee represented on those shelves. So let me ask you a question. How did you choose the particular brand of coffee that you bought? Was there a salesman standing in the aisle trying to persuade you to purchase one brand over the other? Was there someone barking at you like a carnival worker trying to get your attention? Of course not. Chances are, you chose a particular kind of coffee because you trusted the brand. Maybe it was Folgers, or Starbucks, or 8 o'clock coffee, or Maxwell House, or whatever your favorite brand is. But the point is, no one sold you on buying a particular product right there in the coffee aisle. Instead, you were pre-sold before you ever arrived at the grocery store because the coffee company had done a fine job of building their brand. Now, of course, buying coffee is just one example. Take a look around at your life, and you'll quickly discover that branding plays an important role in many of your buying decisions. And it's not just you. Your friends, your colleagues, your families, and even your prospects and customers, they all factor in branding when making their own buying decisions. Now, the fact is, people buy from those they know, like, and trust. And the only way to build up this sort of trust is by building up your brand. Now, here's the crazy thing. The brands that people are buying might not even be the best solution. But people like to buy brands with which they're familiar. Because they trust them, right? They know what kind of experience they'll get when they use a trusted brand. Now, imagine for a moment that you're traveling on a highway and you get hungry. You see Bob's Fast Food Hamburger Shack sitting right next to the Golden Arches. Do I even need to tell you what restaurant sports the Golden Arches? If you said McDonald's, you're right. And that's just further proof that branding works. Even little children can spot the Golden Arches on the highway from miles away and start screaming from cheeseburgers. Now, with all else being equal, and assuming you're looking for fast food and not gourmet dining, there's a pretty good chance you're going to go to McDonald's rather than Bob's Hamburger Shack. Now, why is that? 
Well, it's because you know what to expect, since McDonald's has built up their brand recognition and a reputation for food that's fast and cheap. How about another example? Think about an online auction site. Which one comes to mind first? Probably eBay. They've built their branding so well that most people don't even think of other auction sites. And how about a search engine? I bet you thought of Google. Or maybe Bing or Yahoo. Again, there's the power of branding at work. Point is, branding is an incredibly powerful way to increase your sales over the long term. When you build a strong brand, you build trust. When you build a strong brand, you develop top of mind awareness. When you build a strong brand, people buy from you simply because they recognize your brand and because they've associated good feelings with your brand. Now, a lot of struggling entrepreneurs don't even think about branding, which is probably one of the reasons why they're still struggling so much. Others spend time thinking about branding, but they think branding is just about picking out a slogan and a logo with pretty colors. I'm telling you, that's a mistake. Branding is much bigger than that. And branding is such an important part of a company's success that serious business owners invest a lot of time and or money into developing a solid brand. What's more, companies that have been around for any amount of time often freshen their brand simply because they know how important it is to change the times. Let me give you a few examples of how companies have branded themselves or freshened their brand. Avis used to be the second largest car rental company in the world, right behind Hertz. As part of their branding, they developed the slogan, We Try Harder. This new branding slogan was considered a huge success and was used for 50 years. What about Apple? Apple Incorporated used to be officially called Apple Computers. However, this name didn't properly reflect their business strategy, as Apple was moving into tablets, smartphones, and other gadgets. So, Apple changed their name in order to capture a bigger market share. Do you think it worked? You bet it did. Just think about the popularity of iPhones and iPads. The point is, branding is really a big honkin' deal. And if you want to dominate your industry, solidify your long-term growth, and cement customer loyalty, then you need to pay attention to branding. Now the good news is, this course is going to teach you everything you need to know about developing and refining a bulletproof brand that can crush the competition. So let's get started by taking a look at the DNA of branding. I'll see you in a moment in the next module. Before we dig in and go too far in this module, I just wanted to take a moment to show you what you're going to learn in this module. Okay. First, I'm going to show you that branding is not just a theory. All right, branding literally can be make or break for your business. It can be the difference between success or failure for most businesses out there. Also, I'm going to talk about the law of branding. Now, don't worry, there's a little equation here, GB equals BG, but there's no algebra, no calculus, nothing like that. It's very simple, and I'll show you that in just a minute. Lastly, I'll talk about branding as the nucleus of your business. So let's go ahead and jump right into this first section here. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard of a man by the name of E. Haldeman Julius? Let me share a quick story with you about him. Okay, Haldeman Julius built a mailing order publishing empire back in the 1920s. He created a company called Little Blue Books, and he built a solid reputation for selling high-quality information inside these little 3 by 5 just little 3 by 5 inch pocket books with the blue covers. What's amazing is that Haldeman Julius sold over 100 million books by branding them as, he called it, University in Print. This brilliant bit of branding resulted in these little books finding their way into the pockets of everyone from college scholars to simple farmers. You can figure that Haldeman Julius built up his little blue books brand in order to easily get both first-time orders and repeat orders. People saw his advertisements in newspapers and knew they could trust the brand. In just nine short years, the little blue books brand was known around the world for producing great pocket guides at low prices. Beyond that, though, Haldeman Julius proved to the world that product names do actually matter. That's because he sold his books just based on the titles of these books. There wasn't room in his ads for descriptions, 
so the titles alone had to sell the books. No fancy sales copy, no long sales letter, no benefit-driven ads even, just book titles. And it worked like this. Okay, if a book wasn't selling at least 10,000 copies per year, Haldeman Julius changed the title. For example, the book The Art of Controversy posted absolutely terrible sales figures. But once Haldeman Julius changed the title to How to Argue Logically, this very same book sold at a fast clip. It exceeded 30,000 copies in sales. One little change, just the title of the product made a massive difference in his sales. Now, you might not be selling books, but the point here is still the same. Branding, product names, slogans, and product positioning all matter. It doesn't matter if you're selling reports or books, software, bird feeders, mouse traps, golf clubs, uh, tuxedos, consulting services, or snow removal services, fishing poles or zombie survival gear, RVs, tattoos, or anything else under the sun. Branding matters. Slogans matter. Product titles matter. Okay. However, branding might not necessarily be what you think it is. And that's what we'll be covering in this module. I'll see you in the next section. Here's what we call the law of branding. It's GB equals BG. Now, if we made this an algebra equation, you'd probably remember that um, G could equal 2 and B could equal 3. So you'd have 2 times 3 equals 3 times 2. Same thing. 6 equals 6. But this is even simpler. GB equals BG is just this. Good branding equals business growth. It's the same thing. By this point, you should be getting the idea of just how important branding really is. Okay, it's a way to set yourself apart from the competition and to gain customer loyalty. It's not just something that big companies do either. It's something that you should do too. And that's because your branding is a long-term mindset, one which will contribute greatly over time to your overall business growth. Most business owners are focused on selling. Just a quick sale today. But you've got to remember, this is a short-term mindset. Because if the consumer doesn't buy right away, they're going to forget about your business and the products you're selling. Okay, that means if you're focused on short-term selling, then you're going to be struggling with commodity-based sales. If we had to sum up the difference, it's this right here. Short-term selling is all about making the sale right now, today. Branding is all about creating customer loyalty for the long term. A good business owner uses a combination of both short-term selling and branding. But a great business owner understands that branding is going to make the biggest impact on sales over the long term. Let me go ahead and show you an example. Let's suppose you are interested in buying a watch. And let's imagine I pulled out a watch brand called Bazinga. You'd never heard of this brand before. The watch looked nice enough, seemed like it kept time, so you asked me, what's the price? And I tell you, it costs $15,000. Let me ask you what you would do. You'd probably laugh in my face, right? Because unless this watch included a free car or the Hope Diamond, it would be really hard for me to sell you on the idea of buying a $15,000 Bazinga watch. But what if this watch was a Rolex? Whether you'd personally buy a fifteen or $20,000 watch, that's besides the point. Okay, That's because Rolex has plenty of customers lining up around the block to buy watches for thousands or even ten thousands of dollars. That's real-world proof that people will buy expensive watches. Is it because Rolex keeps extraordinarily good time? Not really. I'm going to say you could go to the local discount store and pretty easily find a $20 watch that keeps time as well as a Rolex. Is it because a Rolex watch is made from gold and other precious metals and gems? Not entirely, because you can also find other watches made from the same materials which don't cost nearly as much as a Rolex. So we have to ask, why is it that people spend thousands of dollars on a Rolex watch 
when they could get similar watches for a lot less money. It's simple. It's because of the Rolex brand. People will gladly spend thousands of dollars just to get the feeling that the brand promises. In Rolex's case, the feeling center around power and wealth and sophistication. In one word, it conveys a feeling of prestige. And that brings us to one of the most important things you're going to need to know about branding. Branding is all about emotion. When some people think of branding, they think of a slogan and a logo. These are, of course, parts of branding, right? But the slogan, logo, colors, and everything else that goes into the brand are all carefully designed to convey some sort of feeling. The whole point of the brand is to produce the feeling that you want your customers to experience when they use or even merely think about your product. Now, why does a brand seek to produce a feeling? It's pretty simple, because consumers make their purchase decisions based on emotion, and then they justify the purchasing decisions they make based on logic. So in order to move your prospects to the order form, they need to feel something. You've got to be tapping right into their emotional buttons. Direct response sales letters, they seek to do this. That's why those sales letters have, usually, some kind of heartstring tugging story in them as a means of connecting emotionally with the reader. But here's something else to think about. The emotion created by direct response sales material starts fading as soon as the prospects stop reading the sales materials. That's why direct response sales letters work so hard to get the sale right now. Because if they don't, the emotion fades and the consumer loses his enthusiasm for purchasing the product or service. Now let's contrast that to branding. If you build up brand recognition, then you automatically associate a certain feeling with your brand. And that means that you don't need to stand there and sell a product to your customers over and over. You don't need to artificially create the feeling every time a consumer comes in contact with you. If you've done your job, your consumer is going to see your brand and associate it with the emotion. Let me go ahead and give you a couple of examples of that. Let's look at Pampers first. Pampers is a well-known brand of diapers in the U.S. If you go to Pampers.com, and I've got a screenshot of their website here, see their ads on TV, or even see their ads in magazines, it's obvious, it's clear that their brand is based on conveying a feeling of love. There are loving images of mothers and babies, soft colors, and even hearts on the site. Okay, it doesn't get much clearer than this what emotion they're trying to convey. Just look at their site logo. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Their soft edges and subdued colors. They've made love a part of their DNA. You may not have considered that before, even if you do know their products already. But Pampers has gone the extra mile, plus a few in my opinion, to make you feel the whole idea of, if you love your baby, you buy them Pampers. Right? Let's go ahead and take a look at another one. Ferrari. Yeah. Who doesn't love a Ferrari? Ferrari is known the world over for their exclusive high-performance cars. And indeed, the Ferrari brand conveys power, performance, and prestige. This kind of branding has not only allowed Ferrari to sell some of the most expensive sport cars in the world, it's also given the company an opportunity to expand their profits through licensing and retail opportunities, things like their association with Formula One racing. Whether you're looking at the Ferrari.com website or even looking at a Ferrari, you'll see the branding at work. People don't buy Ferraris to simply get them from point A to point B. Just look at their logo. I'm not knocking it. It's perfect for what it does. But honestly, I don't even think it's that good looking. But people don't buy Ferrari merchandise because they like the red, yellow, and black colors. Instead, people buy in order to capture the feelings of prestige that go along with the Ferrari brand. If there's only one thing I'm sure of, it's this. This logo never made anybody feel like kissing a baby. All right? To me, it's all rip, snort, and room, zoom, zoom. For as long as I can remember, their branding has locked that into my mind. And probably the mind of anyone else that has ever heard of a Ferrari. Speed, elegance, exclusivity, 
That's what Ferrari is all about. Okay? Now these are just two examples of two brands that convey a feeling. But if you look around, you're going to find that the biggest brands in the world are all associated with a specific feeling. Think about a few of these big brands and ask yourself, what is the feeling they convey to you? FedEx, McDonald's, Nike. I'm going to guess that as I said each one, your mind quickly recalled not just a visual image, but a familiar feeling of some kind. Pay attention to these feelings as you examine the brands around you, all right? But I've got another point here. The second thing you'll notice is that while a company may freshen its brand image from time to time, they always avoid doing anything that dilutes or otherwise ruins the reputation of the brand. For example, Rolex simply isn't going to start mass producing and selling $50 watches. Ferrari isn't going to start making $50,000 Ferraris, as that would damage the feeling of prestige that comes with exclusivity. And I can guarantee that Pampers isn't going to create a website based on scary black colors or with gothic mommies and pale babies, right? Okay, likewise, once you develop your brand image, you'll want to do everything you can to protect the image while you continue to build the brand. You'll learn more about that in the upcoming module. But for now, let's do a little recap and I'll see you in the next section. As you've just discovered, developing a brand is about conveying a certain feeling to your prospects and customers. This brand should completely permeate your business. You need to consider the following questions here. The first one, is your brand image effectively conveyed through your website? Yes or no? Is your brand image effectively conveyed through your product names and product packaging? Is your brand image effectively conveyed through your sales material? Fourth, is your brand image effectively conveyed in all of your content, such as blog articles? You can probably see we want to be thorough and make sure that our brand image is conveyed consistently through everything we do. But let's ask a couple more questions. Is it effectively conveyed in all channels, such as social media? Is it conveyed in all communications, including customer support or customer inquiries? Lastly, ask yourself, is your brand image protected in any decisions you make about managing your business? This is what we talked about in regards to not diluting your brand in the decisions you make. Okay? In short, your brand should permeate your entire business. No part of your business should be untouched. Your brand image is the nucleus of your business. It's the heart of it. Okay? So what all do you need to do to make sure this brand permeates your business? That's what you'll find out in the next module. First, a quick reminder. Okay? You should have already downloaded the training manual that came with this course. Be sure to check the training manual because it includes a training exercise you can complete to help you better understand the concept of branding. All right, let's go ahead and take a break and then we'll move on. In this module, we're just going to have a couple of topics to talk about. I'm going to introduce you to the art and science of branding, okay? And then we're going to talk about branding anatomy, and that's going to be it for this one. As you just discovered, your brand permeates every facet of your business. And that's why companies that invest seemingly enormous amounts of money on a brand redesign are often happy to do so. It's basically because these business owners know that the brand will impact their long-term growth. Let's take Pepsi as an example. When Pepsi refreshed their brand, they spent a cool million dollars for the logo redesign. I mean, really, a million bucks? Why that much? It's simple. It's because they weren't paying for just a graphic design. If they were paying for mere graphics, they could have hired someone to just whip up something for a hundred bucks or so. The reason they paid so much is because they were investing in a concept. And what's more, their logo designer was capturing their entire brand and conveying it through a graphic. Simply put, the average graphic designer doesn't 
have the skills required to create conceptual logos for branding purposes. And even though a million dollars sounds like a lot, that's by no means the most expensive brand. The BBC paid $1.8 million to freshen their brand and logo. And the consultancy firm Arthur Anderson, which was found guilty of mishandling an audit of Enron, they didn't just freshen their brand. They developed and built a new brand to the tune of $100 million. You know what's ironic about this? Many people have never even heard of Accenture, but that's what they did. Plenty of big companies have done their branding and logos in-house, sometimes for comparatively very little money. Microsoft used an in-house team. Okay. Google's original logo was created by founder Sergey Brin. Twitter did it in-house also, with the only cost being just $15 to purchase a stock photo. Now, Twitter has spent more since then to refresh and update their branding, but starting out, they were able to do it pretty inexpensively. The point is, those who have the know-how to do it themselves can get it done very affordably, and even for free. The good news is that this, of course, is going to arm you with the tools and knowledge you need to create your own bulletproof brand. So while you may need to invest a little bit to create a logo if you don't have design skills, you'll be able to craft the concept once you've completed the course. So let's break down what all you need to create. See you in the next section. Let's talk branding anatomy. So far we've just touched on what all is included in a branding image. Now here in this section, I'd like to talk about what all facets you'll need to consider as you start developing your brand. In the next module is where you'll actually learn how to develop and refine your brand image. Here's what we'll be talking about in this section, which are the five P's of branding anatomy. Product names and titles, product packaging, positioning, pricing, and penetration. So let's go ahead and jump in and look at these one by one. There are three approaches to creating product names and titles. These include overall branding, product branding, and hybrid branding. Let's take a look at that first one, overall branding. This first approach is to brand your overall business and then create a string of product names and titles that are going to reflect this branding. Okay, the Chicken Soup for the Soul series of books is a good example of this strategy. Today you'll find dozens of branded books in the series, such as Chicken Soup for the Mother's Soul, Chicken Soup for the Dog Lover's Soul, probably even Chicken Soup for the Chicken Soul. I don't know, maybe. Another example are the Dummies books, such as the Windows 8 for Dummies and Investing for Dummies. Another example are the gadgets that Apple puts out. You probably already know what that is, but when I say these names, you're going you're gonna to know right away. How about the iPhone, iPad, iPod, iMac, okay? See what it is? While the company brands the product alongside the name Apple, they further brand the product by creating names that start with the letter I. A final example is Sir Richard Branson's conglomerate of virgin companies. Even though his companies are in different industries, such as travel and entertainment, they're still all branded under the name Virgin. Examples include Virgin Books, Virgin Airways, and Virgin Mobile. One good reason for adopting this approach is that it allows you to focus on building one brand. And once you've built that brand recognition, you can apply that brand to all of your related products or companies and reap the benefits. Okay? Virgin is a really good example of this strategy at work. The second approach to branding is to brand each product individually without taking the overall company brand into consideration. Okay, in other words, the individual product brand becomes more important than the company brand. And let's take the example of the PepsiCo Incorporated company. This company puts a focus on branding individual products separately. A few of their beverage brands are Tropicana, Sierra Mist, Ocean Spray, Mountain Dew, Lipton Tea, and a whole lot more. And, well, of course, including Pepsi, right? The point is here that PepsiCo doesn't use the brand name Pepsi in all their beverage names. You drink Mountain Dew, not Pepsi Mountain Dew. You drink Lipton Tea, not Pepsi Lipton Tea. And, of course, you drink Ocean Spray, not Pepsi Ocean Spray. 
As you might suspect, this is a little bit more costly and time-consuming to develop a different brand for every product you put out. However, the advantage is that it allows you to more directly compete for your customers and position your products in the market. Then there is the third approach to branding, which we call hybrid branding. This is where you display your overall company branding alongside individual product branding. Okay, it's a combination of the two. The company branding allows you to tap into trust and familiarity, while the individual product branding allows you to better position your product in the market and compete for customers. One good example of this is to look at the car companies. All of the car companies brand their overall business name, such as Ford, Chevrolet, Porsche, and so on. But these car manufacturers also brand their individual cars, such as the Mustang, the Corvette, Boxster. However, you'll note that these individual product names are often paired with the company's branding. So you hear people refer to the Ford Mustang, or the Chevy Corvette, or the Porsche Boxster. Matter of fact, Ford Motor Company, the parent company, has Ford and Lincoln sub-brands, okay? Then each of these sub-brands has individually branded products, and this is really quite common in the auto industry and other large industries. This allows the company to tap into the consumer's trust of Ford, Chevy, or Porsche, while still developing a branding strategy around the individual cars. And this is important because these car companies create products that appeal to different segments of the population. Okay, Ford brands and advertises the Mustang in an entirely different way than they brand and advertise their family sedans or a Lincoln SUV, for example. Okay, So keep these things in mind while you're considering how to decide on a product title or product name. Once you decide on your product title or name, then you need to think about packaging, and that's going to bring us to our next facet of branding. The product packaging. To me, this is where it gets fun. What do you think? Do people judge a book by its cover? Yeah, you bet they do. People often make their decision about whether to buy a product just based on the product packaging alone. And just to be clear, I'm not talking about only books here. If you're selling snowshoes or software, books, videos, fish tanks, golf clubs, anything else under the sun, all right? Keep in mind that the packaging does matter. People are always going to form an impression of your product just based on the way that it's packaged. Now, obviously, what you need to do is create your packaging based on your overall branding. We'll talk about developing your brand more in the next module. But for now, keep in mind that branding is all about, remember, creating a feeling. Thus, the colors and the way you've packaged your product need to help convey this feeling. Let me give you a few examples of that. We mentioned the Dummies line of books a few minutes ago, right? Someone who's familiar with this brand can recognize these books from 50 feet away, no problem. That's because they all have yellow covers with a black Dummies banner splashed across the top of the cover. It's consistent and it's recognizable instantly. Take the example of Apple products, like Macs and iPhones. In all cases, you'll see the graphical Apple not only on the product packaging, but on the product itself. Now think about some of the products you buy quite often. Think about your favorite sodas or cereals, laundry detergents, and candy. Think about how those are packaged. Chances are they're all in branded packaging. They're easy to recognize, and their packaging conveys the intended feeling. For example, Quaker Oats Cereal Company in the United States packages their oatmeal in the familiar red, white, and blue tubs with the Quaker Man logo. Just look at this. Everything about the packaging and branding says, this is wholesome cereal, right? It's the kind of food that parents feel good about feeding to their families. Or take the example of Budweiser Beer, which is branded as the king of beers. The product packaging says, this is a good beer, a regal beer. It's the king of all beers. Of course, whether you actually agree with that is an entirely different matter altogether. But the point is, everything about the packaging, from the colors to the logo to the font style, is helping to sell the beer. Again, it doesn't really matter what you're selling. You need to create product packages that reflect your brand. You need to create packaging that makes people feel good about choosing your product. The next thing you need to consider 
is how you're positioning your product, and that's next. Okay, positioning your product in the marketplace is something you definitely need to be thinking about. This is referred to as your unique selling proposition. And it's this positioning that answers the consumer's question, and they've always got this question. Here it is. Why should I buy from you and not your competitors? Okay, positioning plays into your overall branding image because your slogan is often your unique selling proposition. A few minutes ago, I mentioned Budweiser, which carries the King of Beers slogan. In just three words, that positioning statement tells prospects why they should buy Budweiser as opposed to some other brand of beer. Let's look at a couple of other examples of how companies position themselves in their slogans. Avis Rental Car Company says, We try harder. This is a promise to consumers that they'll get good customer care and be satisfied with Avis. United Airlines used to use the slogan, Fly the Friendly Skies. Most people don't think of airline travel as a particularly pleasant thing to do. I personally kind of find it miserable, but United Airlines tapped directly into this sentiment by promising travelers that they'll enjoy their flights with United Airlines. Folgers Coffee claims that their coffee is mountain grown. Truth is, most coffee is mountain grown, right? No big deal. But Folgers state claim to this unique selling position by being the first to include that as part of their overall branding. As you can see by these examples, just because you're creating a unique selling position doesn't mean that the factor itself needs to be all that unique. What it means is that you need to be the first in your industry to claim that factor. Again, look at Folgers. All their competitors have mountain-grown coffee. The difference is that Folgers was the first to make the claim. Okay? They even registered mountain-grown as their trademark. The same will apply to you. When you're thinking about how to position your brand in the marketplace, you don't have to position yourself around some factor that nobody else in your market has ever touched. You just need to be the first to really claim it among your competitors, which usually means incorporating it into your branding. We'll talk more about this in the next module, but first, let's hit on the topic of product pricing. And before we move to the next section, let's go ahead and pause for a quick break, okay? Hey buddy, want to buy a $50 Rolex? <laughs> okay, your customers have certain expectations when it comes to product pricing. One thing that really influences their expectations is how you've developed your brand. If your brand is somehow tied to pricing, then you better take your branding image into consideration as you price your products. For example, brands that convey a feeling of luxury, sophistication, wealth, power, prestige, exclusivity, and similar feelings, they tend to have high price tags. I mean, think about it. If Rolex started selling $50 watches, or if Ferrari started mass-producing $50,000 cars, both of these brands would be severely diluted. So pricing is obviously an important part of maintaining the brand. We're not just talking about high prices, though, either. On the flip side, some companies market their products and services as being low-cost. The retailer Walmart is a good example of this, as at times they've even branded themselves with taglines like you see here, low prices every day. So what happens if shoppers start finding that Walmart isn't the low price leader anymore? The brand gets diluted. And when the brand is diluted, people lose trust. Loss of trust, of course, leads to loss of sales. Then there's other companies that don't even state claim to having the lowest or the highest prices in their industry, but rather they claim to have the best value. An example of that is the hotel chain America's Best Value Inn, which carries that branding right into the name of their hotels. They may not be the lowest price hotel, but they're not exactly promising low prices. Okay, rather they're promising the best value, or as I like to say, the most bang for your buck. That's why these hotels tend to have amenities such as free breakfast, a pool, a gym, microwaves in the room, and a lot of these hotels even accept pets. In short, they give people what they want at a very affordable price. Point is, you need to think about how your brand is going to influence your pricing. In some cases, your brand may not heavily influence your pricing. 
In other cases, such as those mentioned a few moments ago, you can inadvertently dilute your brand by pricing your products incorrectly. So just keep in mind what your brand feeling conveys about pricing. Now let's go ahead and take a look at our final facet of branding. And that is penetration. By penetration, I'm talking about incorporating your overall brand image into every facet of your business. This starts by developing visual and text representations of your brand, including your logo and your slogan. These two things, right here, these two things tend to have the most influence on how you convey your brand image. That means that once you develop your logo and your slogan, everything else you create will revolve around these two factors. In this way, your brand penetrates every aspect of your business. For example, your logo. The colors of your logo are going to influence your web design and also your product packaging. Your branding slogan is going to influence the copy on your website. Your overall branding image is going to influence how you communicate with your prospects even. So whether you're writing a blog post or a Facebook post, a Twitter tweet, or you're just emailing one person, your brand is going to penetrate all of those communications. Now, a lot of people realize that branding comes into play when you're designing a site or even writing sales copy, but they don't give much thought to how their branding is reflected in their communications. Let me give you an example here. United Airlines, with their Fly the Friendly Skies slogan, seemed to imply good customer care. Now, if a customer called the airline and ended up talking to a grumpy representative, you can be pretty sure that would reflect badly on United Airlines. It's touching their brand. And if enough people started reporting bad experiences with United Airlines customer care, then it's going to dilute the impact of the entire brand. The point here is, your branding really does penetrate into every facet of your business. And that's why in the next module, you're going to discover exactly how to develop a brand that helps you grow your business. But first, let's wrap things up for this module. Let's take a fast break, and we'll see you in the next section. All right, this module won't take long. We're just going to do a little recap here with a few final thoughts on branding anatomy. As you just discovered, your branding influences everything you do, including your product names, your packaging, your positioning, pricing, and penetration. And I want to emphasize here, you need to make sure that all of your communications reflect your brand. And if you're outsourcing some of your day-to-day -day business activities, then you need to make sure your freelancers and employees are all well aware of your brand and how this brand should be reflected. Everyone, I'm going to repeat that, everyone that touches your brand needs to understand it. For example, copywriters need to thoroughly understand your branding, including your unique selling proposition, in order to position and sell your products correctly. Your customer service representatives must be taught how to reflect your brand in their communications with prospects and customers. Even content writers, like ghost writers, must understand your brand and positioning so they can reflect them in the writing they do. The bottom line is your brand and the feeling you wish to convey should be reflected in everything you do and everything your freelancers do. Once again, as a reminder, check the manual that accompanies this course Okay, because it includes planning sheets to help you organize your branding strategy around the facets you just learned about in this module. So, how do you develop this sort of influential brand? That's what you'll learn about in the next module. I'll see you there. Let's talk about developing and refining your branding formula. Just going to take a quick second to show you what you're going to learn here. We're going to talk about the branding boiling point. You're going to determine what feelings you'd like to evoke with your brand. You're going to learn about researching your competitors, about developing multiple concepts, how to ask the market for feedback, split testing different concepts, and then we will go through some closing thoughts on branding alchemy. 
You've been learning about what a brand is and how to fully integrate it into every facet of your business. From your communications, to your pricing, to your logo, your brand needs to be reflected in every facet of your business. This is important for two reasons. First, good brand penetration is important to brand building and recognition. In other words, if your branding isn't reflected in everything you do, then you're missing out on an opportunity to build brand recognition and strengthen your brand. And you don't want to miss out on that, okay? Secondly, good brand coverage means that your prospects and customers will consistently feel whatever it is your brand is conveying every time they come into contact with your business. Okay, that's a good thing. Because when your prospects and customers feel the emotion conveyed by your brand, then you're making them feel good about doing business with you. Point is, the branding boiling point is when your brand permeates every facet of your business. Of course, this is only true if you develop a good brand, a strong brand, right? A brand that appeals directly to your target market. Fortunately, that's exactly what you'll discover how to do in this module. You're going to learn about choosing a brand image that conveys the right feeling. You'll learn about building your brand around a factor that's important to your prospects and customers. And you'll find out how to test your brand to see if you're on the right track. Now, you know where a lot of people make a mistake? It's in this. They spend weeks or months even carefully planning every facet of their business. They research their target market. They examine product distribution channels. They determine the best ways to reach market. And despite all of this careful preparation, they completely forgot about branding. So what do they do? They slap a pre-made logo they found on a stock photo site, and they call it good enough. But I'm telling you, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. That's like a guy spending an entire week planning a date with some woman and then not showering or changing into clean clothes before picking her up. Gross. Look, you can be sure he's going to make the wrong impression doing something like that, and she's probably going to slam the door in his face. The same thing with your business. If you make the wrong first impression, your prospects might slam the door in your face and never come back. So you want to make sure you make the right impression by using the following formula to create a little branding alchemy. And here's a quick review of the steps. Step one is select the right feeling. Step two, research the competition. Step three, develop multiple concepts. Step four, ask the market for input. Step five, testing your concepts. So next we're going to look at each of these steps of this branding formula and we'll see you in the next section. Alright, are you ready to go? Let's take a look at the first step of branding alchemy. If there's one thing we've been emphasizing throughout this course, it's the fact that your brand is all about evoking a feeling. And that means that when you sit down to develop your brand, you need to think about what type of feeling you'd like to convey. Your first step is going to be to ask yourself these two questions. All right, first question. What feeling do my customers have while they use and enjoy the product? Question two. What feeling would I like my customers to have while they use and enjoy the product? Okay, these aren't necessarily the same thing. The first question really applies if you've already got products out on the market but you haven't yet put in the time and resources to properly brand them. Basically, you want to at least be aware of how your products make your customers feel. The second question is relevant whether you've begun branding your products already or not. It's important because how you brand your products can influence how your customers feel when they use your products. Let's go back to the example of some of the luxury brands like Mercedes or Rolex. People who purchase these luxury brands aren't doing so because they need a good way to get from home to work. All right? It's not because they need a reliable timepiece to make sure they're not late. Instead, people buy these brands because using the products makes them feel good. Driving a Mercedes makes the customer feel successful and sophisticated. And wearing a Rolex watch makes the wearer feel prestigious and powerful. Point is, these products aren't purchased for pragmatic or utilitarian reasons at all. They're purchased for the emotion and the experience that the brand promises, okay? Since the companies have done a wonderful job of protecting and building their brands, the consumers do indeed experience the feelings that the brands convey. 
So what you need to do is to start with a list of feelings that you'd like associated with your products and company. Here's a nice long list of ideas to get you started. Okay, if you need a moment to look these over, go ahead and just pause the video and read them. I promise I'll be here ready to continue when you press play. <laughs> you go ahead. I'm just going to grab a cup of water real quick. I'm getting kind of thirsty. All right, I feel better. You ready to go? Okay, I'm assuming you've given the list a looking over, and let's go ahead and go on. Obviously, there are other emotions and feelings that your brand could convey. This isn't an exhaustive list. And you'll probably notice that I didn't even mention the negative emotions like fear, hate, sadness, or anger, because in most cases, you won't want your product associated with those kind of emotions, right? There's exceptions, of course. If you're selling something like horror novels, then you do want to create a brand image that conveys fear or horror. Also, let me take a moment to clarify that there is a difference between the emotions you evoke in your short-term sales process versus those that you seek to evoke with your brand. Your brand is associated with the emotion you want your consumers to feel when they use your product. So in most cases, your brand is going to be associated with a positive feeling. However, your sales system may induce the so-called negative emotions on just a temporary basis, so it can move your prospects toward the order button. As an example, offering a limited time discount evokes fear. Those people who are afraid of missing out will buy your product now before the sale is over. Invoking anger is another often used tool in the marketer's toolbox. For example, you might receive a fundraising letter from a politician or maybe a charitable organization, either of which may incite your anger against a cause, a person, or a situation in order to simply solicit donations. But evoking negative emotions is something that you usually only do in a direct response sales situation. And what's more, these emotions are usually temporary. In other words, the marketer or business owner doesn't want these emotions to become associated with the business or the product itself. Instead, the emotions are just aroused as a means of getting the prospect to take action. So, in other words, you can use and evoke all kinds of emotions to sell something to someone. Generally, though, you'll want your brand to be associated with only positive emotions, such as the ones listed here on your screen. Okay. So once you draw up a list of possible emotions that you'd like your brand to convey, your next step is to see what your competitors are doing. So go ahead, grab a glass of water for yourself, and I'll see you in the next section. Your next step is researching your competitors. Okay, you need to find out how your competitors are branding and positioning themselves and their products, and here's how you're going to do that. If your competitors sell physical products that you can see at a local retailer, go ahead and go check them out. This will give you an up-close and personal look at how the competitor packages their product. You'll want to be sure to pay attention to the text on the packaging, as this will give you an idea of how the competitor positions their product. It may be that you can't get your hands on a tangible, actual product, and maybe your competitor doesn't even sell tangible products. Okay, if that's the case, then your next step is to view the competitor's virtual storefront and virtual shelves. They likely have their products right up on their websites. If not, you'll probably find them in other marketplaces like eBay, iTunes, or Amazon. Your next stop is going to be to visit your competitor's websites, as this is probably where you're likely to get the most information about their branding and positioning. All right, let's look at this in a little bit more detail here. You want to take note of the following. What is the competitor's business name? Okay, Some of your competitors may create business names that are meant to help their overall branding image. For example, the Discover Card Company has a business name that evokes feelings of exploration, curiosity, and of course, discovery. Right? Look at the competitor's product names. If your competitor has multiple products, browse them all and take notes of all the names. Okay, What sorts of feelings do these names evoke? Next, take note of the branding strategy. Does the competitor brand individual products based on the overall company brand? Do they brand individual products separately? Or does the company employ the hybrid strategy we talked about, where they combine the company and product brands? Okay, identifying these things in your competitors and what they're doing is going to help you to form 
more clearly what you need to do for your products. What else do we have here? Um, take a look at your competitor's logo. As you discovered earlier in the course, some companies invest a lot of money in developing their logo concepts. This way, the brand can give you a lot of information about the company's brand images. You want to look at the font style, if they have one, the colors and the graphics, if that applies. Again, ask yourself what feeling the brand conveys. Don't forget to ask that question over and over. What is the feeling? Okay, and ask yourself how the brand represents the company also. For example, is the logo bold and confident, or does the logo convey more of a warm, loving feeling? Next, look at the competitor's slogan. Usually, but not always, you're going to find the slogan right beneath or next to the logo. The slogan is typically one concise statement that sums up what the company or product is going to do for the customer and or why the customer should choose to buy that particular product or do business with that particular company. In short, the slogan is often the company's unique selling position. Okay. Look at the competitor's web design also. Take note of the overall design of their site. Take a look at the colors. Take a look at the graphics and pay attention to how they're placed. Take note of the overall feeling you get when you look at the design. Again, pay attention to what sort of feeling that design evokes. Also think about how you would describe the design. Is it artsy? Is it professional? Clean? What other words come to your mind when you look at it? Then look at your competitor's web copy. Read the text on your competitor's sites. Especially pay attention to the sales pages for specific products. And ask yourself, what is the competitor's unique selling position for that product? Also, ask what emotions is the competitor trying to evoke? Ask what benefits does the consumer likely enjoy while using the product? Okay, and there's an easy way to find out what the consumers are reporting. All you have to do is read the customer reviews and testimonials. It's pretty simple. Finally, the last step you need to take is to examine any communities or publications where your competitor regularly shares content. This can include the competitor's mailing list, their blog, any social media pages they have, and that would include things like Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. The way your competitors have designed these communities will give you some additional insight into their idea of branding. Okay. The way your competitors have designed these communities will give you some idea of their branding. However, you'll also begin to better understand their brand image and positioning by reading their content. Now, all of what I talked about for the last few minutes, of course, rests on the assumption that your competitors are very aware of their own branding image. If you run across a competitor who doesn't seem that conscientious, then you don't need to spend too much time studying their brand image. That'd be a waste of time. But you can learn an absolute ton from the ones that do pay attention to their branding. So use that information to your advantage. Okay, now that you've completed this step, you can go ahead and move on to the next step. We'll see you in the next section. All right, we're at the first step for branding alchemy, and at this point, you know what feelings you'd like your brand to convey, right? You know what feelings your competitors' brands are conveying, and you know how your competitors are positioning themselves. Now, your next step is going to be to start developing your brand and positioning as a means of conveying a feeling to your prospects and getting a bigger market share. The main thing to remember here is that you need to develop a brand image and a unique selling position that your market cares about. If your intended audience really doesn't care about them, then your brand and unique selling position will be weak and it's going to be ineffective. Okay, let me give you an exaggerated example just to show you what I mean. Let's suppose you sell baby products like clothing. Chances are you're going to design a brand and unique selling position around comfort, convenience, love, security, and similar factors, right? Okay, now imagine if you designed your brand around something like prestige or power. Imagine bold black and gold designs like this one. Imagine a slogan <laughs> that invoked power, something like putting other babies to shame. Come on, it's ridiculous, right? Unless this brand was part of a tongue-in-cheek humor campaign, you can expect that this particular brand simply wouldn't work for parents who are wanting to swaddle their newborn babies in safe and comfortable baby clothes, right? 
as silly as it is, there might actually be a niche market for something like that, but that's not probably where the real money is. Okay, so that's a totally exaggerated example. You're not likely to make mistakes of that magnitude. However, you may end up with a weak or ineffective brand if you don't truly understand your market. So let's quickly go over this key concept. If you're new to the niche you're working in, then you need to spend some time researching this market in order to get a better feel for what's important to them. Okay? We shared a bunch of tips for researching your market in the first training course of this series. Okay? Of course, you can learn more about that course and register for it at successhive.com. The upshot is that what you need to do is spend time with your market. In order to understand them, you're going to need to crawl inside their heads, so to speak. You need to find out what they like and don't like about the current solutions on the market. So how do you do that? Let me share these three tips with you, okay? You need to visit niche communities. By niche communities, I'm referring to blogs, social media sites like Facebook, and also niche forums. Basically, you visit any site where members of your niche are discussing niche topics. That's simple. Just spend an hour reading these discussions and you'll get a much better understanding of your market's needs, wants, their hopes, and their fears. And naturally, you should read the product reviews belonging to your closest competitors. It's easy if your competitors have your products listed on retail sites like uh, Walmart, iTunes.com, Amazon.com, or similar places, as these sites tend to gather a lot of product reviews. If you can't find your competitor's products on these sites, then run a search in your favorite search engine for the product name followed by the search term review. Keep in mind, though, that many of these reviews you'll encounter this way are likely to be biased, as many of them are written by affiliates as opposed to actual customers. Once you find reviews written by actual customers, though, look for patterns across the reviews. Just from the words they use, you may get a sense of what they're looking for in a product. For example, if you were selling baby products, you might see comments that directly reflect a parent's desire to keep their baby safe. That might be a clue to you that a brand built on safety and security is going to work well for that particular market. Finally, another way to get at what your prospective customers are looking for is to survey them. If you have a WordPress site, you can use a tool like the iPerceptions survey plugin or you can use a third-party site like SurveyMonkey.com. The idea here is to simply ask your market what it is they're seeking in niche products. You can ask both open-ended and multiple-choice questions to find out what factors are going to be most important to them. Okay? This will give you an idea of how to build your brand. Once you understand your market and you know what's important to them, plus you know how your competitors have positioned themselves, then it's time for you to start developing your branding concepts. You may have noticed I use the plural concepts and not the singular concept. That's on purpose. That's intentional. The reason is because you should develop at least three good concepts because in the upcoming steps you're going to be testing these concepts. Now, as you already know, your branding is going to permeate every facet of your business. However, at this step, we're going to be concerned with two components of your brand image. The first is your unique selling position. The second is your logo. Once you've developed your unique selling position and logo, then you can develop your product packaging, your web design, your sales copy, and everything else that goes along with those two components. For example, your branding slogan will express your unique selling position, and your web design is going to reflect your logo. So let's start with unique selling position, which is also called the USP. As we've talked about already, your USP doesn't actually have to be unique, right? In other words, your competitors may also possess or utilize this factor, but they just haven't laid claim to it. They haven't said, this is ours, right? Nonetheless, if you can truly find something unique about your business or unique about the product, if you find something that no one else offers, then really, that's even better. That's, that's the ideal, okay? There's a manual that accompanies this course, and inside that manual, you're going to find planning sheets to help you brainstorm and develop a unique selling position. Be sure to take the time to use those. For now, though, let me share with you an overview of how to develop your USP. The first thing to know is that your USP can be based on just 
about anything, as long as it's something that is important to your prospects and customers. So let me give you a list of some of the possible ways to uniquely position your business. How about a strong or unusual guarantee? Domino's Pizza used to offer a delivery guarantee that if customers didn't get their pizza delivered to the door within, I think it was 30 minutes of ordering, then their order was free. Okay? Domino succinctly summed up this unique selling position in their slogan, 30 minutes or it's free. That's a good example of a strong guarantee. Other examples include lifetime guarantees, which are often used by things like mattress companies, or double your money back guarantees, which you'll see information marketers offering from time to time. Another angle you might take is, what about if your product is made in an unusual way? Folger's Mountain Grown slogan is an example of creating a unique selling position based on how the product is made. Another example is the U.S. pizza delivery chain Papa John's. Their slogan is this, better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John's. While they don't use particularly unusual ingredients in their pizza, their point is their pizzas are better because they use better ingredients. And another example of this is Harley Davidson, which claims American by birth, rebel by choice. Okay, that slogan captures the market share of customers who want to purchase American-made products. In other words, it invokes a feeling of national patriotism, but it also evokes a feeling of independence and freedom with its use of the word rebel. Here's another. Let's say you have some special qualification for creating the product. This unique selling position tends to work well for those who are selling information, um, like books, videos, even seminars. That's because you can easily establish yourself as an expert or an authority in the niche. Joseph Sugarman is considered one of the top marketers and copywriters in the world. He's credited with the success of such products as the Blue Blocker sunglasses. Now, when Sugarman wrote a book about copywriting, he positioned himself by establishing his credentials and expertise right in the title of the book. Check it out. The title of his book is The Ad Week Copywriting Handbook, The Ultimate Guide to Writing Powerful Advertising and Marketing Copy from One of America's Top Copywriters. Okay, that's a long title, but it's very descriptive, and it includes himself positioning himself as one of America's top copywriters right in the name of the book. It's a great way to go if you've got the qualifications to back it up. If you can claim to be the first or the original in some category, then you've got an edge here. If you are the first to create a product or service, then you can use that as part of your unique selling position. For example, you can claim to be the original and the best. Uh, the Cheesecake Factory, for instance, is one such real-life example. You'll see that they position themselves as the original, the original Cheesecake Factory. However, you don't need to be the first one in the entire world in order to claim this slogan. Instead, you can be the first one in your region, or maybe you're the first woman to do it, or maybe you're the first person under the age of 25, or the first person over the age of 50. In other words, create your own categories and then claim to be the first in this category. For example, you could be the first person in London to offer a particular service, or you could be the first person in California to sell a particular product. Okay, you see how this goes? Let's look at another one. Your product is used in a different way than similar products. It seems like a lot of beer commercials tend to depict nighttime party scenes or perhaps even scenes from sporting events. So the beer maker Corona jumped on this, and they separated themselves with the slogan, Find Your Beach. In other words, Corona positioned themselves as a beach party beer. All of their advertising, if you notice, is built on this slogan, and all the images displayed in their advertising tend to depict Corona on the beach. Naturally, this doesn't mean that you can't drink a Heineken on the beach, but Corona positioned themselves as the beach beer, the fun beer so they develop top-of-mind awareness with consumers. Well, this might be a lot to chew on, and I don't want to wear you out, so let's go ahead and take a quick break, and then we'll continue this section. We've got a few more angles we can look at here, okay? How about if your product provides some special benefit or enjoyment? Okay, A lot of USPs are built on this concept of differentiating a company or product based on a benefit that the consumer gets when they use the product. 
So let me give you a couple of examples on this one. Uh, the first example of this comes from the chicken restaurant KFC, which claims their chicken is finger licking good. Another example is blogger.com's slogan, push button publishing. That's their slogan. It tells users how easy it is to use the service to create a blog. Another example comes from the credit card company Visa, which states that it's everywhere you want to be. The idea being, of course, is that consumers will be able to use their Visa anywhere in the world, which provides peace of mind. Or take the chocolate candy M&Ms, which promises the candy melts in your mouth, not in your hands. Walmart has had a few different slogans over the years, and their current one is, Save money, live better. How about Disneyland? They use the slogan, The Happiest Place on Earth. That slogan not only captures the benefit, but directly conveys the intended emotion. There's no ambiguity at all in what they want you to feel. A final example that many of us are familiar with, how about Energizer batteries? They promise long life with the slogan, they keep going and going and going. So be sure to review your product benefits and consider whether one of the special benefits that maybe somebody else doesn't offer can be used to differentiate your product in the market. This is a simple one. If your product is the best, say so, okay? Porsche conveys this superiority with the slogan, there is no substitute. Quite simply, they're the best. The Hallmark greeting card and gift company also taps into this feeling with their slogan, when you care enough to send the very best. Okay, for some people that are maybe a little bit more humble, this might feel strange, but I'll tell you what, the marketplace is no place for humility, just to put it simply. All right, if your product is the best, there's no reason at all why you shouldn't let the world know it. Maybe your product fills a market gap. In the age of big sedans and huge sport utility vehicles being popular, Volkswagen developed the slogan, Think Small, which in just an instant differentiated them from the competition. Another example is Apple's Mac Pro, which had the slogan, Beauty Outside, Beast Inside. This filled the market gap where consumers usually had two choices. They had fashionable computers that didn't do very much or powerful machines that were kind of ugly. The Mac Pro's branding promised consumers they could have both beauty and power in one machine. Maybe your product is delivered differently. A good example of this would be Burger King's slogan, which is, have it your way. This directly differentiates them from other fast food restaurants where most people think they have to order exactly what's on the menu. Now you can go into a lot of other burger chains and order specifically what you want. My grandmother used to go into a well-known place and order a cheeseburger without the bun. They had no problem giving that to her. Okay, you can do it just about anywhere. But Burger King capitalized on that customization of your order and made it an integral part of their branding. Tapping into a person's desires and self-identity can be powerful. L'Oreal, which is a company that develops beauty products like shampoo and makeup, has a slogan that says, because you're worth it. Thus, even if L'Oreal's products carry a higher price tag, the slogan taps into women's desires to pamper themselves and be beautiful. Okay? Another example of this comes from the charitable organization, the Red Cross. Their slogan is, the greatest tragedy is indifference. Most people like to think of themselves as caring individuals, right? I know I do. So this slogan taps into that sense of self-identity and, honestly, even <laughs> induces a little bit of guilt if people don't donate or help. Kind of clever, isn't it? Your product promises a great customer experience. As mentioned earlier in the course, United Airlines made this promise with their slogan, Fly the Friendly Skies. But another example comes from Marks and Spencer, whose slogan says, The customer is always and completely right. Now, whether or not that's factual is debatable, but Marks and Spencer is making a strong point to say, Mr. Customer, we're going to put you ahead of ourselves in any and every situation. And that's powerful. Okay, that was quite a list. But you can see that these categories and examples should give you a lot to think about with regards to how to develop your unique selling position. What you'll want to do is start with your USP, 
and then boil it down to one succinct statement. This statement can then be your slogan, which you use on your website, your products, your marketing materials, everywhere else too. The planning sheets that are inside the manual which accompanies this course will walk you through the process of developing your USP and turning it into one succinct statement. Okay? But for now, let me give you a real life example. Let's suppose you are selling lottery tickets. You'd ask yourself what your customers want more than anything else. Well, this is a no-brainer. Obviously, they want to win. The problem is you can't promise your lottery customers that they'll win. Sorry, can't do it. However, you can tap into their hopes of winning, right? You can get them dreaming about what it would be like to win, and that's exactly what the National Lottery in the UK did when it created the slogan, It Could Be You. Those four words instantly evoke hope, excitement, big dreams, and you can bet that slogan worked well to sell a lot of tickets. <laughs> I actually heard an ad on the radio for a local lottery once use something that was kind of similar, but it didn't have nearly the same pull. Their slogan was, okay, get this, we guarantee you'll have fun. Um, really? <laughs> That's it? To me, it sounded like they were saying, just don't plan on winning. All you're going to get is fun out of this. Do you see why this falls flat compared to it could be you? Here's another real life example. The Subway restaurant came onto the scene at a time when fast food restaurants like McDonald's and Burger King were really popular. However, people were more and more viewing these other fast food restaurants as unhealthy and even a little bit disgusting since the food sat under warming lights. Subway realized what their customers wanted was an alternative to the typically unhealthy, warmed over fast food fare. Okay, so they expressed this desire in just two words, eat fresh. Simple, very simple. But it worked so beautifully that Subway overtook McDonald's as the world's largest restaurant chain in 2011. That's huge. Okay, you see how that simple slogan worked for them? Again, be sure to complete the planning sheets in the manual, which are going to help you develop your own succinct slogan based on your unique selling position. Now let's move on to the logo. As mentioned earlier, this is the part of the process where people often turn to professionals. That's because turning a branding concept into a graphical representation does require some specialized skill. Okay? As such, if you outsource this part of the process, don't look for graphical artists. Instead, look for professionals who tout their expertise in creating logos and branding concepts. Nonetheless, even if you hire a conceptual logo artist, you still need to give him or her an idea of what you're seeking. So let's talk about this for just a moment. Okay, at this point you already know how you want to differentiate your business or your products using a unique selling proposition. And you know what type of feeling you'd like your overall branding image to convey. So take just a moment now in considering these following questions. Okay, first one, what color conveys the brand feeling? What font faces and styles convey this brand feeling? What types of graphics convey this feeling? How can you incorporate your company, product name, or brand name into the logo? How can you incorporate your USP into the logo? Let's consider a couple of examples before we finish this section. The Jaguar car company carries the slogan, Grace, Space, Pace. Their logo fits both their name and their brand beautifully. Okay. It features a sleek silver Jaguar gracefully leaping over the word Jaguar. Another example is Burger King. The words Burger King are between two halves of a golden bun. The colors of the logo, which are gold, red, and blue, are all royal colors, which reflect the king concept. Another example is the Maxwell House logo. It isn't clear from the name itself that Maxwell House sells coffee, but it's clear from the logo. That's because the logo depicts a coffee cup, and the logo also includes the slogan, Good to the Last Drop. Now, all of these logos include graphical components to create the logos. However, some logos are simply text logos. In these cases, the font face, the style, and the color are all carefully selected so as to make the logo recognizable and to help convey the brand feeling. Clairol, which sells hair care products, uses simply the word Clairol with a nice, simple black font on a white background for their logo. 
Their slogan is nice and easy. Thus, their simple logo completely supports this feeling of nice and easy. Another example of a text logo is Google, which is composed of different brightly colored letters. Google's slogan is do no evil, and this fun childlike logo embodies that branding concept in a very simple way. As you can see, even the most simple logos are well thought out, and they all do their part in supporting the overall branding concept. So what I want you to do is to use the included planning sheets to help you create at least three logo concepts. Then go ahead and move on to the next step, and I'll see you in the next section. Branding Alchemy Step 4. Ask the market. The idea here is going to be to form a focus group comprised of people who most closely represent your target market. Okay, So if your target market includes 18 to 30 year old males who own iPhones and live in the United States, then these of course are the types of people who should be in your focus groups. Naturally, you can do this offline and face to face, which gives you a better opportunity to interact with your market. Not only can you ask follow-up questions, but you'll also be able to look at facial expressions and body language. These expressions provide a great clue as to how your market really feels about your branding concepts. However, in most cases, you're probably going to do this online, such as via a survey. That's fine too. Your main goal here is going to be to make sure that you don't lead your focus group by asking biased questions. What I mean is this. Asking a question like, does this bold logo give you a feeling of confidence? That's a leading question because it predisposes the person to answer yes. It does that because the word bold biases the reader. In most cases, you're going to find it better to ask open-ended questions rather than multiple choice or yes-no questions. That's because people are likely to give you answers you never even thought of. And this is the kind of valuable feedback that you want. You don't want to just think from your own experience and your own biases. You're looking for fresh input. Okay, so some examples of open-ended questions might include, what five descriptive words would you use to describe this logo? What does this logo make you think of? What does this slogan make you think of? How does this logo make you feel? And here's a few more. How does this slogan make you feel? Based on this logo, Rate your level of trust in this company on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being low trust and 10 being the highest level of trust. Or how about, based on this logo and slogan, what kinds of products or services do you think this company provides? Okay, the answers to some of these might really surprise you. Of course, what people tell you and what they actually do can be two different things. That's why you'll also need to complete the next step, which you'll find in the next section. We'll see you there in just a moment. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about split testing different concepts. While asking your market about your branding concepts through focus groups or surveys is part of the process, you need to split test your concepts in order to let your customers vote with their wallets. Okay? It's the only way to know for sure which branding concepts really motivate your customers to do business with you. And it's not that tough. You'll recall that E. Julius Haldeman made a fortune by perfecting the art of testing, tracking, and tweaking. If one of his little blue books didn't sell well, all he did was change the title. He didn't change the content of the book or anything else. He just changed the title. With that one simple change, he was able to take poor selling books that only sold a couple thousand copies and turn them into best sellers that sold tens of thousands of copies. He tested, he tracked, he made a tweak, and he tested and tracked again repeating the process until he got the results he wanted. Okay. Another good example of someone who tests concepts is Tim Ferriss, who authored the book The 4-Hour Workweek. He tested several concepts by running Google AdWords campaigns with different book titles. The 4-Hour Workweek was the title that won, even though Ferriss admitted that really wasn't his favorite. Okay. But he knows that audience appeal is more important than his own personal feelings. And that's why he's gone on to use that same branding concept across multiple products, such as the 4-Hour Body and the 4-Hour Chef. Point is, you can't just rely on your own intuition or your personal bias when it comes to product titles and overall branding concepts. 
Instead, take some time to test these concepts out. You can easily do this in a short amount of time, even in as little as a couple of days, by just creating a Google AdWords campaign and tracking to see what gets you the most click-through rates and what concepts get you the overall best conversions. For example, if you're testing product names, then include the product name in the ad headline while keeping the body of the ad exactly the same. The click-through rates on that ad will tell you which titles have the most appeal, while the overall conversion rates will further confirm if people are going to buy the product or not. Here's what you need to keep in mind as you start testing your product titles, your packaging, logos, and your overall branding concepts. First, you want to use reliable tools. You can start with AdvantageBot software, which is available at successhive.com. It's going to help you create the best titles. Then you can track your results using Google Analytics or an alternative called Piwik.org. You want to make sure that you test just one thing at a time while you hold all the other variables constant. For example, if you're testing a product name, then everything else about your campaign needs to remain the same. Your traffic sources, the ads, the colors, the logos, etc. The only way to tell for sure what is working is to test only one element at a time. You'll need to get your results quickly also. Using an advertising platform like Google AdWords is going to be a great way to drive a lot of targeted traffic to your site for the test. If you already have a mailing list, then of course you can split test titles and other factors via email. Okay, so let's take a quick break and we'll move on to the next section. Let me go ahead and share a few final thoughts on branding alchemy with you. Okay, you've learned a lot about developing, refining, and testing your brand in this module. Let's recap the branding alchemy steps. Step one is to select the right feeling. As you've already discovered, branding is all about creating a certain feeling, right? But in order for your brand to be effective, it needs to create the right feeling. Step two, research your competition. Here you learned that in order to create your unique selling position, you need to get a feel for what your competitors are already doing in the market. Step three, develop multiple concepts. This is the video that you'll want to return to again and again as you develop your brand, and be sure to complete the planning sheets included for this one as well. Step four, asking the market for input. Once you've got a few concepts, titles, or other facets of your branding image, then you can ask your market for their feedback. This feedback, again, it may surprise you, and it may even have you going back to the drawing board before you complete the final step. That's okay, you wanna do it right. Step five is to test your concepts. As you discovered in this video, the best way to find out if a concept is gonna work is to get it in front of real paying customers. Once you find a branding concept that's a winner, then be sure to implement the concept into every facet of your business to build this image and develop brand recognition. Basically, you'll want to get your new image to market as quickly as possible before your competitors beat you to the punch. Fortunately, the planning sheets that come with this course make it easy for you to develop and refine your branding image, so be sure to make use of them just as soon as you've finished with the video training. Now let's wrap things up, and I'll see you in the final module. Do you remember the GB equals BG formula I shared with you earlier in the course? As a friendly reminder, that formula stands for good branding equals business growth. I'm going to guess that by this point you're probably pretty convinced that it's true. You need only look around at some of the biggest and most successful companies in the world to see that branding is one of the most powerful tools you have in your business arsenal. Yet, sadly, so many people overlook it. It's no wonder that 95% of business startups fail. But guess what? You're different. That's because you now know the importance of branding. Better yet, you know now how to develop your own bulletproof brand that draws more prospects and customers to you while killing the competition. Don't forget, branding literally, okay, literally can be the difference between success and failure. As you've already discovered, it's all about conveying a feeling. It's about setting yourself apart from the competition and giving your prospects a good reason to buy from you rather than from your competitors. 
It's about knowing what's important to your prospects and customers so that you can directly tap into their emotions and touch their hearts. This isn't something you can sit down and do in just 10 minutes. Well, at least not if you want to do it right. Okay, That's why I strongly encourage you to print off the included manual so that you can use the planning sheets and checklists to develop, refine, and build your own powerful brand. And that concludes this course. Okay, listen, I'm very glad you took this course because it gives you an edge that the majority of business owners fail to master or even comprehend. But of course, you won't get any advantage if you just tuck this information into some cobwebby corner of your mind and forget about it. You need to take action. And there's no better time than today to start implementing these strategies. A good place to start is by completing the planning sheets in the manual. Feel free to review all the material as often as you need to so you can really get a handle on it and put it into practice. So thank you for being part of this course. Just go ahead and get started. Because the sooner you develop your brand, the sooner you can grab a bigger piece of the market and absolutely dominate your niche.